we are all one. We are all connected. If you understand that and start to believe that, that's extremely powerful. And all of this fear mongering and, you know, God forbid, watch the daily, you know, the nightly news and things like that. All that starts to wear away. Look, all of those, all of those, those channels are struggling. All mm -hmm. of them. Uh, all the all the news networks, they're all struggling because they're still using the old playbook. They don't understand that, yeah, fear works in the short term. And that's what they did. They, you know, fear, if you're afraid, you're gonna buy more, you're gonna consume more. And that's part of marketing. You know, if you're a marketer, you understand that fear is a motivator. But people are tired of it. Alex Ferrari, and I am on your superior self. Alex, my man, thank you so much for taking the time. I recently found your content in the last couple of months, and I was like, man, I got to have this guy on. Like, he's very <laughs> inspiring. His story is so unique. So thank you for taking the time. Oh, thank you so much for the invitation, man. I appreciate you. I find myself listening to you so much, like during my interviews, sometimes I like, I'll have like, I'll start sounding like you. Like I'll, uh, <laughs> I think what it is, like... <laughs> You say sir a lot. So like I, I find myself saying uh, like something like, um, so sir, or you know what I mean? Like you start picking up on things that people say. I did too. Yeah. When I you listen to I mean? certain podcasters, I, I started picking up things uh, along the way. No question. Or like my friend, like I almost, I almost said it then. I was like, my friend, I was like, oh, that's Alex. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, my friend. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so man, like I just so interested about your story. You, you are this award-winning filmmaker, producer, director. Um, and now you have a podcast on spirituality and then mm -hmm. your first book had something to do with the mob. And I was like, Whoa, that's interesting. I, I know all of us have these unique journeys and not, not one looks the same. Right. So I just want to learn more about you. I want to learn more about that journey and, and how it unfolded. So um, yeah, let's, let's dig into it. Yeah, sure. So, uh, I, I was, a, I've been in the film industry for close to 30 years now. And, uh, I came into it wanting to be a film director and I fell into, uh, editing and post-production, uh, where I was doing, uh, editing, color grading, you know, making the colors look nice for movies, uh, and ending, ended up being a post-production specialist. Then, uh, also starting also at the same time being a commercial director, doing commercials, music videos, things like that uh, along the way. And then uh, many close calls on on making big features along the way, meeting biggest movie stars in the world and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, when I was younger, uh, I had a book. Uh, my first book is called Shooting for the Mob, where I was almost made a $20 million movie for the mafia. And I had a gangster uh, who basically threatened my life on a daily basis uh, for about a year. And we were trying to make a, a movie on his life. And uh, that was interesting enough. But then Hollywood took him seriously and I was flown out to LA and I met literally the biggest movie star at the time in the world, uh, as well as, you know, billion dollar producers and, you know, at the Chateau Marmont and at the Ivy and doing all those kind of dinners and stuff. And being really close to the dream and then getting yanked away from you at the end, went into a depression for three years or so, selling comic books out of out of a garage, my friend's garage on eBay, and uh, until I got myself back on my feet. And then I uh, just kept going and kept going. I had no idea the effect that that experience would have on me to the point where I was self-sabotaging my career and I could never get a directing uh, feature off the ground, even though I got close so many times and it just kept falling apart and falling apart until I finally decided to say, screw it. I'm going to, I'm going to just do my own thing. And I, within 30 days of making that decision, I shot my first feature with a bunch of my friends in LA. And then that was sold to Hulu, uh, sold internationally. Then I did my second feature, which I did for like 3000 bucks. 
and it was a love letter to independent filmmakers and the insanity that we are all are as artists. And during that time, I had the idea. Oh, and I also opened up an olive oil and vinegar store for three years. I heard uh, that's that. a whole. Yeah, that's a whole other story. Uh, I was off. I, I got burnt out from the film industry, so I tried jumped into olive oil because obviously that's where the money is. And uh, and then during the end of that chapter of my life, that last year, I decided to open up an online business after reading a book called The Four Hour Work Week by Tim Ferriss. Hmm. And that kind of I started to just absorb everything I could about online marketing and. Um, online businesses and everything like that. And this is now 2015. Hmm. And then I launched this podcast in 2015 uh, called Indie Film Hustle, all about um, the truth about independent filmmaking. I didn't hear anybody telling anybody the truth. And I had a shrapnel in my life that I said, I think I can help some people. Launched that three months later, it was number one on Apple. Um, and it's been number one ever since. Uh, and we're still going strong. We're on episode, you know, we're closing in on 700 episodes wow. at that at that point on that show. And then I uh, launched a, another podcast uh, called Bulletproof Screenwriting, which is all focused on screenwriters. And on that show, on those shows, I talk to Oscar winners, uh, you know, blockbuster actors, producers, Emmy winners, you know, every, and, and and from the three thousand dollar filmmaker to the billion dollar you know, filmmaker that, you know, has won an Oscar or two mm -hmm. and everything in between. And, uh, I did, I've done that now for, we're closing in on eight years now since we launched in 2015, but in the, um, in the spring of 2021, a friend of mine said, you should open up a podcast on spirituality. And I said, you're nuts. And she said, no, I think you should. And you should probably do it in three weeks. I'm like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> she's like, yeah, you need to open it by Easter of 2021. And I was like, she's like, that'll be a good time to open it. And I'm like, this seems pretty insane. She's like, you know, it would be insane for most people. But for you, Alex, it's you can do it. I'm like, all right, why not? So I launched, I, I come up with a title, you know, all that stuff. Uh, get some guests. <laughs> it's just a lot you know you have a podcast you know how insane that is to try to yeah, launch yeah. something from scratch in a niche that has i have no credibility in whatsoever well were you Filmmaking. spiritual before that like at all oh of course no no i've been i've been a closet spiritual person for years meaning that you know i read autobiography of a yogi and and i've been meditating for a few, you know at that point i'd probably been meditating for a few years um as well deeply like an hour to a day or something like that and oh yeah i've been i've been i've been doing that most of my life i've always been curious i've always wanted to learn more about everything really especially in the spirituality space so it wasn't a stretch for me but it was a stretch for me so i put it all together launch it on easter and i started doing i think an episode i think an episode a week and then uh, all of a sudden, Bruce Dickinson shows up. I don't know if you know who Bruce Dickinson mm -hmm. is. He's the lead singer of Iron Maiden. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Friend of mine calls up and is like, hey, do you want Bruce on your show? I'm like, sure. Uh, and then me and Bruce have this amazingly spiritual conversation about being a rock star and what how he channels his, you know, what he does, how he channels the, the creative energy, all that kind of stuff. And that episode takes off. Uh, I had another friend of mine who was a filmmaker, but also happened to be a channeler by the name of Daryl Anka, mm -hmm. uh, Bashar. Mm -hmm. And I'd been working with Daryl for over a decade. And I had worked with him for like four or five years before I even knew he channeled. <laughs> and I said, hey, I have this new show. Do you mind coming on? He's like, yeah, sure. I'll come on for you. And that chat, that episode blew up. So during that, those two episodes really kind of exploded the show mm -hmm. in a in a small way, but it grew the show. And then I started getting scared. Uh, I started getting really? scared. Yeah, I started getting scared because um, you have to understand, I come from the filmmaking space and I have this whole empire kind of thing, company that I've built up in the filmmaking space and I didn't want to 
destroy it mm -hmm. by people thinking like, oh my God, he's gone off the deep end. He's talking about God now. He's like, what is he born again? What is he talking about reincarnation sure. and yogis and stuff? Like he's gone crazy. So there was that big fear there. So I actually pulled back. I started pulling back and instead of doing one a week. I started doing one every other week. And, and for anybody who knows me and knows my work output, you know, I've been doing two episodes a week of each of my other shows now for years. So that's four episodes a week on that, on those two shows. And sometimes I'll even go three a week, depending if I felt froggy or not. <laughs> so I could, I'll, I, I'll put a obscene amount of content. And then I start pulling back to the point where I just like, you know what, I'm just going to stop for a few months and regroup. So I stopped for the last quarter of 2021. Mm -hmm. And I said, I, I just, I made a lot of excuses, rebuilt some of my websites, did a bunch of stuff, but at, at a certain point, I had to this kind of come to Jesus conversation with myself at the end of December. And I said, okay, God, if you want me to do this, I'm all in. I'll, I'm in your hands. Uh, I just took the leap of faith. I go, I'll build a set. I'll set up a separate computer. I'll set up a whole system. I'll do it. I'm going to go all in. And I did in January first or first week or second week of January, I started putting a podcast back out. And then started pumping them out regularly. I was like, well, I'll do at least two a week uh, to start because I want to, if I'm going to do this real, I'm going to build this show up very quickly. And that's because I want to, I want to attract bigger guests quickly. Mm -hmm. So because I was attracting bigger, uh, to attract bigger guests quickly, you need to show some sort of weight. Five episodes ain't going to do it. <laughs> so I started doing that. And after a couple of months, I said, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to do three a week. <laughs> So I started doing three episodes a week and the door started to swing open and all these guests started to show up and these conversations started to show up. And then in July of last year, I had one episode go viral. Hmm. And when that went viral, I was like, oh, I doubled my subscriber base. I think I was like a 1500 and I, then I jumped to 3000. Which one was, was that? Like, it was uh, Betty Eddy. Uh, really? she's, yeah, she's a near death experiencer. One of like the original near death experiencers. No reason for that episode to go by the way. Um, yeah, a little bit controversial thumbnail, but nothing crazy. None of her other interviews that she's ever done had gone that big before. So there was no mm -hmm. reason for it to go big. I had no idea why, but then my show went back down to a, a new, a new baseline and that kept going. And then October of last year, um, all hell broke loose and it just, <laughs> one episode after another episode after another episode after another episode. And now we are uh, closing in on 70,000 subscribers mm -hmm. very quickly. And I think we're averaging 1.7, 1.8 million downloads a month. That's insane. It's insane, man. For a, sh for a show that's young and for that kind of subscriber base, it doesn't make sense. Sure. There's but something think, going on. But I think you have to give more credit to yourself because you have this right. personality, right? Like that people can relate to. Like you're, you're like, every, you know, I listen to you. I'm like, man, this, this sounds like me. Just the thoughts in my mind, right? Like I listen to you. Appreciate that. And you have a, a great way of having a conversation with someone where it's not awkward. You know what I mean? Like I, I make notes and you can tell when people are just reading from a script and you don't do that, right? Like you're, no. you, I mean, you're just popping these questions out like, you know, pulling from source almost. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, to a certain, I mean, I do have a list of questions and a lot of times I don't touch them. They're backup questions. They're backup sure. in case that the interview or the conversation starts to lull somewhere and I can't find something. I always have something to turn to. Sometimes guests are a little harder and yes. I have to, I have to use every question. Sometimes I ask the first question and I have, I never look at the, 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 the list again and after, and we're an hour and a half in. So there's those interviews as well that are so wonderful to be a part of. But I just felt that, you know, the same way I looked in the filmmaking space when I walked in, I was like, I, there are other podcasts in the filmmaking space at the time. And I thought it was late, by the way, because it was 2015. It was like, oh, all the podcasts are done already. And uh, I saw that the, there was, uh, there was a, a missing element there of truth that I could provide. And there was no one doing it with my style, um, my personality. Mm -hmm. There's just nobody. So I was like, let me see what I can do. So in the spirituality space, I did the same thing. I looked into it, it looked at all the shows that are around and 
you know, all the big shows. And, and, and if you want to talk about, you know, being late to the party, I mean, how many spirituality podcasts are there <laughs> in the world? So uh, on YouTube and on Apple and all that kind of stuff. So I thought it was really late. You know, mm -hmm. this is truly a, a leap of faith. And mm -hmm. I never, I thought oh, maybe in a handful of years, maybe it'll eventually catch up to what I'm doing with Indie Film Hustle where now it's, it's demolished it um, completely within a year, less than a year. It, it overtook what I had done over the last seven years within less than a year. It's amazing. But I said, I said the same thing. I looked at the, the landscape. I was like, there's nobody presenting this information the way I can. Sure. And, and, and not better or worse, not, it's just my flavor, my approach to things. You know, when I have a channel or on, I go, you know, you're nuts, right? This sounds crazy. <laughs> I do this all the time. I'm like, this is insane. Like, how did, like, how did your family, like, no one talks like that to channels. Sure. Yeah. And channels love it, by the way. They all like, yes, I know. I'm sorry. I go, so when you started hearing voices, what did you, like, what was that about? Like, did you think you were going nuts? Yeah. People don't talk that way normally in this space. People are very either far woo-woo, gone off the deep end woo-woo, or they're too antiseptic about yeah, things yeah well there's a fear too right of like i want to look like i know what i'm talking about I, right. it happens to me too right like i'm speaking to someone and they say something which i can i can kind of i can i can keep an open mind and, and kind of relate to but then then again it's like man that's like far out there but i don't say anything because i don't want to look like one you don't you don't want to be disrespectful but you don't want to you know it's you, you admit right that that sounds crazy. And and you, then you can turn it into something different, right? A very colorful conversation where some people are like all balled in and they got to be very serious and they got to be like, I'm, you know, I'm the authority on this topic. You know what I mean? So you kind of bring a lot, a lot of, a lot of different you know, color animated um, conversations to the forefront on spirituality and just saying what everyone else is thinking. Yeah. And I, I think it's the, I, I, I don't come at it this with ego. I really don't. Um, a lot of people in this space and in all podcasts, they come at it from a point of ego. Uh, I know that I really don't know a whole lot. I mean, I look, I, I'm going to give myself some credit. I've been studying this stuff for years, and I understand a lot of these concepts at a higher level than most people. But when I'm talking to a yogi in India, um, you know, who's been doing this for 40 <laughs> years and meditating in a cave somewhere, like, are you kidding me? Like, I'm not going to. I, I, I can have a conversation with them, but I, I don't proceed to think I know everything. Generally speaking, people that come on my show are the authority in, in, in the space. And I treat them as such. Uh, but I have inform and I have my point of view on certain things and and I have my way of dealing with you know certain concepts and things like that. But I come at it in a very different way. And my personality is very fun. You know, I, I tell jokes, I crack jokes. It's simple because if someone who didn't have the tone or the energy that I bring to a conversation said, you know what you do sounds crazy. That could be taken extremely badly. Offensive, yeah. Very offensive. But no one has ever, not once, has ever been offended by anything I've said on the show in, in the conversation. The comments are another conversation. We could talk about <laughs> the comments. But, um, but generally speaking, the, those things don't bother them. And it's, it's, it's the same way. If you, I don't know if you're old enough to remember Don Rickles. No. Don Rickles was a comedian from the Rat Pack days, like, mm. you know, from Frank Sinatra and those guys. And he was in the casino with Scorsese and all this kind of stuff. He, all he does is roast people like destroys them completely. He's, he, he ripped apart presidents. He's like, but he did it with so much love that no one ever really took offense. And he would say things that you just like, <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Like how in God's green, like he's like cracking on the president at the inaugural, like ripping him apart. And people are like, I can't believe, but he did it with love. So that's similar action, the similar way I approach things. I, I do it with respect and love because look, when you hear a channeler about the channel or talking about channeling, everyone watching is going, this is insane. This is crazy. Yeah, this is crazy. Absolutely. This this does not this is not normal. So bringing that out into the air and just go, hey, we all know what's here. Now, now that we all accept what's going on, whether you like it or don't like it, believe or don't believe, at least we it's it's not like we're not talking about the elephant in the room. Sure. 
and and you know and that's the way i look at it and mm -hmm. with with channeling specifically i always tell people because people ask me do you believe i go believe don't believe it's not it's not relevant is what the person is saying hitting you is it something that is helping you if it is take it and use it in your life if not discard it and move on absolutely that's exactly how people should approach this stuff with an open mind and like a, an open heart almost just to kind of see how it hits you right like how right. does it hit you um yeah. you have a lot of nde years right N near mm. death experiencers i love those right like um what what's the commonalities that you find in their stories love is the first one even the negative ones have love in it uh, that there's the, the other side is completely about love, uh, that each NDE is custom built for the soul that is going through it. So if you believe in Jesus, Jesus generally shows up. Hmm. I says that my, my running joke is, you know, Jesus is the hardest working man on the other side because he's <laughs> everywhere all the time. Um, the, but so if, if you believe in hell and believe that you have to go through a hell mm -hmm. that happens. Just had someone on recently who did that. And she actually said, I went through it because I believed it. Hmm. Uh, that I, because I was raised Catholic and that was what I thought I had to go through, but you didn't have to go through it. Uh, so there's that, the customization of it all. There's always a point of no return that they can't go beyond a certain point. If they do, they can't, they're not going to be able to come back. Um, the generally near death experiences are there because the soul has gone off track. Mm. Uh, the the soul has gone off track to what they agreed upon in their soul blueprint or their soul planning prior to coming onto earth, coming onto the earth field. That that they've gone off track because we all have free will. So even though we might plan to be a rock star, and all of a sudden we're like, no, nope, you're you. I'm only playing basketball and watching, you know, Netflix. Like, no, no, no. You, you, you decided to be a rock star. Why aren't you a rock star? Yeah. Uh, or why aren't you a scientist? Like, no, I wanted to go. It's something to kind of push you in the direction uh, that you're supposed to be on. And in many ways, many times I've heard that like, this is an exit. This is an exit. Do you want to go or not? Do you want to go back or not? Cause if you want to leave, we can leave and we can start this over again somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's exit, exit points in a life a lot of times that the, you pre-build into your life where you're like, there's a car accident or there's a surgery or there's something that happens that if you want out, this is the time to go out. Not all the time, but some things, things like that. I've heard, uh, I've seen this as things that are common denomination, uh, uh, denominators. Um, and even I've studied some uh, indigenous near death experiences, which are fascinating. Yeah. Uh, fascinating. What's the difference? What's the difference? Well, um, I had an expert on indigenous near death experiences on the show the other day, and he was. I was like, "So, what are like the Bushmen? Like, what's their near death experiences like?" Because mm -hmm. the only reason we're even seeing more near death experiences is because we understand now how to resuscitate people. Uh, so it's a rarity to find a Bushman who gets resuscitated <laughs> uh, because there's not a lot of whole CPR and you know sure. clear in yeah. in the bush, yeah. uh, but. From what I understand, they don't see a tunnel of light or a void. What they see is a tree and they go through a knot or a hole in the tree. Really? That is, that's the way they go in. Wow. Uh, the Aborigine walk a gravel path or a path of some sort. There is no tunnel. They don't even have a concept of tunnels. Uh, in the ancient, if you start going back, because there are some near-death experience stories in ancient times, in China, they would see um, – politicians in really? their town their town's politicians because they they held so much weight in their life at that time in history that that's who they would see so it, it is all relative it all relative it you know if you believe in if you're hindu and you die you're you know you might see vishnu you know you might see uh, you know shiva it, it, it depends if you're buddhist you might see buddha you know or it could just be a relative or it could just be like your third grade teacher like it's, oh, it's I don't the, want that at all. Yeah, I, definitely not my third grade teacher. Uh, maybe my fourth, maybe my first. She was sweet, um, but but generally, but generally speaking, it, it, it's all relative to the to the soul. So it's not something that is standard. But there are common things. There is the council of elders. Possibly there is a life review. Um, 
a lot of times there's life reviews. A lot of times there's relatives, not always relatives. It all depends on what the situation is and what kind of near-death experience is. But the one thing that's constant 100% of the time is they're all changed when they come back. Mm. None of them are the same. Have you they a- never go never go back to the way they were. They're much more empathetic. They change their lives. Many of them lose, you know, they they break up with their their spouses. They just because they can't handle this new version of mm. of them of, of their spouse. So a lot of times they just divorce or break up because they can't deal with it. So the reintegration back into this reality, right? Like it's tough. Well, it's just they're different now. And once you see it, once you see that, most of them they're like, I just want to go back. Yeah. Like this, this is hell. This is, I don't want to deal with this crap. Uh, I re- I'd much rather be back there than be here. So there's that, those are those other common, uh, common denominators that I've mm-hmm. seen. Well, you know, this is, uh, this reality. Like I've, I've, I've interviewed a lot of spiritual teachers and mystics and, um, people that have had unique experiences or peak experiences. And they, they all point to that, that this is an illusion, right? Like an yes. aborigine, who has a near death, you know, they, I've, I've heard people talk about how they, they, they see this as a waking or a dream, right? Yeah, so, a dream. so to them, it might be just, you know, they have a near death and they just wake up and they, and they're in the true reality or whatever that looks like. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Like being a virtual reality, like as a filmmaker, as a director, do you think it's just like one major play and we're, and we're all just kind of like co-creation or, or what? I think, I think the, I think that we are in the matrix in many ways, maybe not with the computer programming and things like that, but we are definitely in, in Maya, uh, in the dream, in the illusion, the great illusion. These are concepts that have been talked about for thousands and thousands of years that this is not reality. The reality is the other side. This is the dream. This is the experience um, that the reality is on the other side. Uh, we are absolutely the creators of our own reality. There's no question in my mm-hmm. mind. Uh, you start thinking about, you know, I've had some quantum physicists on and we start going deep into the, down the rabbit hole on this stuff. And it's just, have you like, had, um, Tom Campbell yeah. on? Oh yeah. Ah, Tom's, man. I love Tom. Tom is, Tom's the best man. He's a quantum physicist who's spiritual. That's, that's a great, great combination. And yeah, his concepts on, on uh, this 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 reality is pretty profound sure um anthony Cl- anthony clark is it i just had him on he's An- another one was it anthony peak peak that's just- it thank you yeah. anthony peak not clark yeah. anthony peak anthony peak him and i had this wonderful because i can go deep into these conversations hardcore in regards to the realities of uh, simulation theory and all that stuff because it's a fascinating idea to me uh without question and I absolutely believe that. It, have you caught just, glimpses of the simulation? Like, have, have you been able oh, to? Oh, you mean like, you know, like, uh, like the cat walking twice in the matrix is like, oh, that's a glitch. Yeah. That means <laughs> that they've, they've switched something in the matrix. I, uh, I don't know if I caught glimpses of that. I just know that there's deja vu. There's things like that, that are deja off. Vu is interesting because it's like, what if this is like the 1 millionth time I've lived this life as Trey. And then like, you know, I've been here before. Right. Yeah, I I don't know. I I, I can't. I, I'm no expert in this, but I just sure. know that that the illusion of the physical and of where we are right now, it just makes more sense to me. And I know that might sound crazy to people listening, but if you just study, you know that sounds crazy, right? Like that's I'm saying it out loud. Like that yeah, sounds no, it, crazy. It is crazy. It is nuts. But when you start studying like the Vedic texts and things like that. They've been talking about this thing for 6,000 years. This is, these are not new age ideas. The concept of karma is old. The concept of the Akashic records is in the Vedic texts. There's, you know, these are not like new agey stuff that there's some, some hippie just came up with. (laughs) These are ideas that have been around for a long, long time. And, and, and they're pretty profound. Mm-hmm. And if you start like you just read autobiography of a yogi, um, that book will mess you up <laughs> well, <laughs> in what, a great like, way. So I have that book, and it's funny that you say that because like it keeps popping up in my reality. Like someone will say something, and it, oh, like I see his picture now behind you, and I was watching sure. like a clip of something to this morning, just kind of hanging out and doing my morning routine, and there's a picture of him. So I feel like he's kind of coming forth a little bit and trying to get me to, you know, read that book. But 
mm -hmm. like for you, like what was the, the main takeaway from that? I was given that book 20 years ago. I read the first few chapters. Couldn't get, I couldn't get into it. I wasn't ready for it. It just wasn't, I wasn't connecting with it at that time. Uh, the concepts inside of it were too far out for me. Um, yogic powers and, you know, that kind of stuff was a little too far out for me. Then I read it again, six, seven years, eight years ago, something like that. And it just started, I started to grasp everything. I was like, oh, hmm. okay, I get, I get it. I understand what he's trying to say and the power of what he says. And it's, it's one of the most transformational spiritual books I think ever written, but definitely ever written in the 20th century. Uh, it is one of the most respected spiritual texts written uh, in our lifetime or, or, or within the last 100, 200 years. Sure. And there's a reason for that. And it, you know, you start looking back. I, I'm, I'm, I'm good friends with the, um, the directors and producers of Awake, the book, uh, not the book, but the movie of his life. And I've had long conversations about because he, he went, they went into the archives and you know they worked with the self realization society and all that kind of stuff. His his comp, his um organization, and just going deep into his stuff. And I've I've listened to almost everything he said that's been recorded audio wise. I've read most of his books. Um, he's just a profound teacher for me. The reason I have a, a statue of Baba G behind me and a painting with all the ascended masters, including Jesus, Ma, and his lineage, you know, there's a reason for all of that. So he's been my gateway into sure. spirituality. Awesome. Everyone needs a gateway. It could be Jesus. It could be Buddha. It could be Baba G. It could be Yogananda. It could be, a, you know, whoever that entry point is. For me, it was Yogananda. Sure. He's definitely knocking on my door, man. Um, uh, you should, op you, you should answer the door. <laughs> you, should, you should answer the door. I'm just letting you know, you should answer the door. <laughs> um, so when you make films, right? Like I was looking on your website, I think it is on the corner of ego and desire, yeah. right? Like, do you feel like that's the, that's the illusion that, that we kind of see in, in our realities every day? Cause I feel like I watched it and I was like, ah, oh, man, that feels so it resonates. It hits a little bit because it's, oh, like, you saw the movie. Like oh, I appreciate that. I feel like it's, I feel like it's, you know, we have these desires, but are, mm -hmm. are these desires just pipe dreams, right? Like, is it the ego? Is it like, what is it? What, like what inspired that movie for you? Was it, your, oh, was it your experience? Absolutely. I mean, to a certain extent, it's the experience. There's parts of me in that main character who's completely delusional because I was completely delusional. And I think the greatest strength and the greatest weakness of any artist is delusion because you have to be delusional to be an artist in the world that we live in. You have to be delusional to want to write or want to direct or want to be a dancer or want to be a rock star. You, you, you've, you've got to be delusional. But then that delusion, there's a there's a tipping point where the delusion takes over and now it's becoming a, a hindrance. It's becoming an anchor on you. And that could take years because now you've been at it for so long that you need the delusion to keep the engine going. And then all of a sudden you turn around and you're 50. Hmm. And you're like, hey, th this didn't work out the way I wanted to. So... Ego is definitely that movie for me was a love letter to Park City because I love Sundance and the Park City experience, but also to filmmakers to under to show them the insanity of mm. what what we do as a film as filmmakers. Um, and it was a very personal film to me. Uh, it's still probably my favorite thing I've ever shot or done, and uh, it 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 did hold very true to to me. But the illusion that we're in. Yogananda said it best, where he said, you go to the movie theater and you see all of these images of love and death and violence and happiness and all these characters doing all these things. And you feel very emotionally attached. You you cry, you laugh, and, and you're focused so, so much on the screen. But what you need to do is turn around and focus on the light which is projecting the images. Hmm. And in that analogy, God is the light. So when you understand that concept, things start making a lot more sense because we look this, this life where everyone takes everything very seriously, you know, uh, as they should in many ways. But at the end of the day, 
in a hundred years, who's going to remember this conversation? Hopefully somebody, maybe it'll still be in a hard drive somewhere, you know, maybe who knows, yeah, yeah. but in 200 years, 500 years, what does it truly matter? Hmm. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way, but if you look at the, it look, because how many millions and billions of people have lived before us and probably done some pretty remarkable things and, and even things that have moved humanity forward. And yet we don't know their names. Sure. So why take things so seriously? Because at the end of the day, when you're on your deathbed, are you going to worry about the bill you didn't pay? Are you going to worry about that guy that screwed you over? Are you going to worry about this is a this is a play. This is a movie. This is an experience. And it should be treated as such. And not doesn't have to be a you know always good, quote unquote. Uh you learn much more from the pain than you do from the the good times. Sure. I found in my life. Man, and that's so many here. there's so many good things in that little <laughs> little rant, man. I love it. Um so this is a this is a play, this is the movie. And we are characters and we all the characters, characters have been, and all the characters have been discussed beforehand. All the characters have been uh, agreed upon as far as like, I'm going to come into your life at this point to teach you this thing and this point. And it could be a person who cuts you off on the road. It could be your husband, your wife. It could be your boss. It could be someone you're just passing on the street and you give them a dollar because you felt to help helping that person that day. Mm -hmm. All of it is orchestrated in a, in a certain way. Now, yes, we all have free will. And that's something that's very clear. There's always a choice. But And I've asked this of, of many channels and very mediums and things like that. I go, well, if everything's planned out, what the hell's the point of this? If we all plan it out, they're like, well, no, it, there is when I when someone tells you, oh, like a medium or a psychic tells you the future of something that's going to happen, they go, it's a probable event. Sure. So like right now, the probability of me starting to curse you out and yell at you and do things, can I do that? Sure. I have the free will or you could do it to me. But that's not probable. Yeah. You see what I mean? Yeah. So it is, it, it's always a possibility. There's always a possibility. You know, a plane can crash down right on, on top of me right now. Is it possible? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Is it probable? Probably not. Hopefully, uh, <laughs> if not, this is, if not, you're going to get a bunch of views, uh, <laughs> but no, but seriously. So when you think about it that way, yeah, certain people are going to be put in your, in your, in your path and you're going to learn these, these lessons and so on. And you have a purpose here and you have a purpose of what you want to learn and what you have to go through and you, and your mission, because we all have a mission in this life. Some grandiose missions, others are small missions. Sure. Some people live a few hours, mm -hmm. some, a few, a hundred years, mm -hmm. you know, it all, and everyone in between, you know, just because someone passes at a young age, they're like, Oh, what a shame. Maybe that was what that soul wanted. I know it's hard to, sure. I know that's a difficult conversation to have, but if you look at it from that perspective, maybe, sure. maybe not, I don't know. Yeah. It's not going to hurt any less. I could tell you that much. Um, and maybe that was the point of that conversation of that, of that scenario. Like, Hey, you know what? Uh, you wanted to go through this. I'm going to help you out. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, it's, it, it, it's from the perspective of where we are, it's very difficult to have these conversations, especially the, the, the harder ones to have. Like, why would you, why would you be want to born, be born into an abusive family? Why would you want to be born with a handicap or, or physical, a physical, um, physical thing or a mental issue or a disease. Why would you do that? Like, what's the point of that? Mm -hmm. um, and the answers I've gotten from some channels have been pretty profound, pretty, pretty profound because those are tough questions. Sure. Those are mind, those are minefield questions. And I ask them because I'm curious to see what they say. And every one of them never hesitate. And every one of them says something pretty profound in, in answering those questions, uh, whether it be, I don't know. I can uh, right now off the top of my head. I don't even. I, I can't remember. But they they were pretty profound. <laughs> if you listen to my show, you you yeah, you'll yeah. Hear well, them. I, I listen to your show quite a bit, and it's you know I think it's a lot of a lot of it is experience and to that 
strengthen that inner being of who you are, who you truly are, right? Like, have you watched um, the documentary on Netflix, Stutz, uh, with Phil Stutz, the psychotherapist in LA? No, I heard that's your second person who've talked to me about that. Yeah, I heard about that. I heard it's um, good. Yeah, Jonah Hill, right? Is that Jonah the Jonah Hill, Hill one? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So he talks about using higher forces and he's a psychotherapist and they don't mm -hmm. usually talk like that. It's usually, you know, you stick to an, uh, an orientation and it's usually, you know, you don't ever come into a, a session with a client and you never really try to solve a problem. You, you're basically a sounding board for the client to come in and they kind of find their own answers. Well, he took the perspective of like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to, we're going to work in the moment and I'm going to give you a tool so that way you can deal with your anxiety issues, your depression, whatever you may be dealing with. And he cultivated these tools, which draw from higher forces, source, God, whatever you want to call that universe. And it gives them the power to get through whatever events they're going through. That struck me as revolutionary because like, there's no psychotherapist doing that. And then two, they're, they're painting this picture that the universe isn't happening. Like, you know, isn't it against you? It's actually placing you in a, you? in an event that is strengthening that inner being, which is connected to source because it has, this, you know, that has um, this wanting for you to, you know, to strengthen yourself because in the end, it strengthens the universe, right? Like it expands the universe. It evolves the universe. Whenever we evolve, it evolves. So it has like dual interest in that. That makes sense. Oh, it makes, it makes all the sense in the world w without question. Uh, I'm dying to see that documentary, by the way. Dude, it is it. so amazing. Like, all right. So you have to read the book too, because like, um, I just got the audible and it's, you know, I, I would watch the documentary first and then read the book because it, you know, it gives you the actual tools and it talks a little bit about the philosophy behind that. Mm -hmm. But again, like, I don't, I don't hear too many psychotherapists talking about higher forces, right? Like, <laughs> But this is, but this is, this, this is what's happening right now. There is a change uh, happening in the world it has been for a while, but it's happening at a much, uh, much more accelerated rate. There's a reason why shows like yours and I, are available now mm -hmm. um why people are listening it's because people are searching do you people think you'll make a do you think you'll make a a spiritual more spiritual film like absolutely towards that like maybe near yeah. near death or something like that well i think the shooting for the mob movie needs to be made because there's a lot of spiritual lessons in that movie um and and, and i i wrote that book for that reason was to to help people understand that they they can get out of bad situations and how not to follow your dreams and things like that. So I think there's some stuff there without question. Um, but no question in my mind that I will be, I'll do some sort of documentary series or uh, narrative series. I, I don't know, but there is a change. A documentary like Schultz will have never hit a mass market like that, like um, in 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, shows like this wouldn't existed 10, 20 years ago. There's just been very few and far between. The audience wasn't ready for shows like this. I feel like the show, like your show and my show, are now starting to grow exponentially or grow more because people want this information badly, very, very badly. And there's going to be a massive wave in this. And you know, just on a on a side note, as far as like Hollywood's concerned, because uh, I've been a, a student of the film industry for most of my career. And then now for the last eight years, talking to everybody, every major player in Hollywood at every level from every kind of job, you come to realize that it, it is, they're, they're in trouble. They're working off of a system that doesn't exist anymore. And people are tired of it. Hmm. And people want something else. They want the more spiritual movies. They want the more, they they want the Shawshank Redemptions, you know. That's a good one. That you is know, a good they one. want the Shawshank Redemptions. They want those kind of films that they, they uplift. I feel that people are getting tired of negative and news and fear and violence at at a high level. Like you know, there's always going to be you know, Quentin Tarantino has taken violence to a, a level that I can't even comprehend. It's artistic at yeah. that point the way he does it. Um, but this gratuitous stuff, people are tired of it. It's not the stuff that worked in the eighties and the nineties don't work today. Mm -hmm. They just don't, the people are not vibing with it. And look what's happening in the theaters. When was the last time you went to a movie theater? Uh, I think I took my daughters like over Thanksgiving break. I think it was. What movie did you see? Strange world, the Disney film that just came out. Sure. The str or, so, uh, a Disney or, film. 
Yeah. When was the last time you went to a film that was a film for you? Ooh, I can't remember. The, can't the remember. last two before the pandemic were Top Gun, because I'm of a certain age, and that's a movie you see in the theater. <laughs> and Avatar, the new Avatar, uh, which is another movie you see in the theater. Oh, my God. It, I love that movie. Oh, so good. So, so good. And other than that, I'm not going to see Marvel movies there anymore. There's no Marvel movie coming out that's like, I got to see it at the theater. I'll just watch it on Disney+. Plus. <laughs> got a big TV at home. It's fine. It's well, which, changed. Which movie started this for you, right? Like that started the... Oh, the, the whole interest, filmmaking thing? The whole film. Oh, it E.T. E.T. E.T.? E. Yeah, E.T. was the one that was the first time I ever thought of making a movie was when I was watching E.T. in 1982, when I was whatever, nine or something like that, 10. Mm-hmm. Um, There's a lot of spiritual messages behind that too. Spielberg is one of my my top people on my list of who I want to talk to. Um, yeah, I want to talk to Stephen really, really badly. I've tried multiple times. I've talked to thirty people who worked with him. And What's your I favorite keep... scene in that entire movie? I mean, there's too many to, to name. I think probably when he comes back to life. Yeah. Yeah, when he comes back to life, you know. But that, believe it or not, but E.T. is not one of those movies I watch a ton of times. Like, it, it affected me. It was my gateway, but it wasn't a movie that still holds that place in my heart. Um, there's other movies that do that. I mean, I, I watch Jaws before I watch E.T. Jaws is a perfect. <laughs> it's perfect. It's a per, it's as perfect of a movie as possible. Back to the Future is a perfect film. Yeah. It's there's per, it's perfection. Um, but for me, Shawshank, The Matrix, um, what dreams may come is up there with it as well. Um, Fight Club, I'd love Fight Club. Fight Club, love Fight oh, Club. Man. I've had the chance to talk to some of the creators behind Fight Club, and you know, uh, those kind of the, the the. But on the spiritual, more spiritual side, Matrix, which is, um, extremely spiritual and philosophical. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first one, it's a game changing kind of film. I, n- I was never, I was never a- awakened to the idea that these films are spiritual, right? Like I just watched a film because it was a movie because it was entertainment. It was, it wasn't until like I started down this path where I started paying attention to the signs. Do you think a lot of directors or writers have like that? Um, they want to put that perspective in there. I I've spoken to them. So yes, yeah. <laughs> uh, a lot of them do. A lot of them do. A lot of them will sneak stuff in. Um, specifically, I just had the writer, the Oscar winning writer of ghost on uh, mm. Bruce Joel Rubin. And Bruce's story is fascinating. He OD'd, but he overdo- he overdosed on LSD in the 60s. I didn't know you could do that. He accident he didn't overdose. He didn't you can't, but he took too much accidentally. He was supposed to take a drop and he took an entire dropper Ooh. of pure Timothy Leary LSD from Switzerland. Uh, in the form, like in like in a jar, and they just like, oops, and he maybe took, like, he just opened 20, up and just left. Like, yeah, t- no, he did. It was twenty thousand milligrams, I think. He was only supposed to take like you know fifty. Um, so uh, his whole body got deconstructed. He went to speak to God. He had a revelation. Came back. His body was put back together. And when he came back, he's like, I got to go on a spiritual quest. He went. He hiked around Afghanistan and India looking for a guru. Met the Dalai Lama. Uh, the Dalai Lama asked him, do you want me to be your guru? He's like, I don't think you're the right guy for me, but appreciate that. Really? Uh, moved on. Yep. Wow. Um, he's like, if I can't find him, can I come back to you? He's like, yeah, sure. And he just laughed. Uh, and he found his guru. And then in his late 30s, he started to write. And that's when he started. He wrote uh, a movie called Jacob's Ladder, mm-hmm. which was basically as close to his experience of that LSD trip as, and if you watch Jacob's ladder, you go, Oh, okay. This all <laughs> makes so much sense now. Uh, and then he wrote ghost, uh, which is, you know, I mean, that has amazing spiritual, uh, things in it. Then he wrote a movie called and directed a movie called my life with mm-hmm. Michael Keaton, beautiful, beautiful film. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. There are filmmakers who definitely sneak stuff up. I've had the producers of what dreams may come on. That movie is obviously all about spirituality and the soul and things like that. But for me, I for me, the movie that really there's two movies that are the most spiritual movies I think I've ever been made, in my opinion. Uh, Shawshank, mm-hmm. and I can explain to you why. I because I I've asked the question why is Shawshank so beloved by everybody pretty much? Like it's just 
beloved. If you watch it, you love the movie. And I go, what is it about that film? Because on paper, it sucks. The name is horrible. It's a prison movie. It's an escape film. Like it's not, there's really nothing that would yeah. say, oh my God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yet, there's some magic in that script and there's some magic in that in that movie that it's considered one of the best movies, if not the best movie ever made, according to IMDb. It like overtook The Godfather as the best movie ever made and most, most beloved. So why is that? And my my feeling is that it is an absolute um, analogy for what we are going through in life, where we come out of a place. Uh, first of all, you're wrongly accused, so that's what we all feel like we're all wrongly accused, sure. and that things that happen to us, like it's obviously not me. This, so you're thrown into prison, which is our existence here. He has to figure this thing out go through hell and back and literally has a near death experience by going through a tunnel of shit. <laughs> I've never thought about like, that. No, you're good. Okay. He goes in, he breaks through by his own will breaks through, has to tunnel through a ton of crap, which is what we all feel like we're doing to the point where we all have hope that after we've eaten and swam through a, a, a a mile of pipe and crap that we get out the other side and we, there, there is a heaven. There is something when he gets out, he gets thrown into the water. He's being baptized by this, by the rain coming in. He tears off his old clothes and he literally is like reborn at that mm -hmm. moment. And then what does he do? He goes to heaven at the end. He goes to a beach somewhere and he's just, you know, grinding, you know, grinding the wood on his boat and, He's got all the money in the world. He doesn't worry about anything. And that's what we all want in our life. So I feel that's what's the connection for that movie. So that's just my own sure. personal explanation of it. But arguably the most most profound <laughs> spiritual movie of all time is Groundhog's Day. That's so funny because it's like I just saw it on my calendar. It's like this month. I totally forgot about it. Groundhog's Day. It is by far one of the most spiritual movies I've ever seen in my life because it's our soul. It's the experience of reincarnation and our soul. And if you start at the beginning, he, at what happens at the beginning? Gluttony, sex, does all of that. But then what happens? He gets bored. He's like, wait a minute, I got to get out of this. How do I get out of this? Well, maybe if I help people, start helping people. He's like, maybe if I start looking inward as, as opposed to outward. And slowly but surely, by doing all of that, he starts to evolve. So the guy who walked in at the beginning who was eating whatever he wanted to and having sex with this person or that person and taking advantage of people because of what was going on, mm -hmm. at the end, he's helping everybody. He's being kind to others. He's understanding. He's evolved to a point where then he's liberated. Once he does that final motion, he's liberated and now he's gone. He's free. That's, the, that's reincarnation. The mm -hmm. whole movie is about reincarnation, about the soul, about what we go through. He just happens to go through it all in the same day again and again and again. But that's an analogy for life again and again and again, sure. different lives going through similar problems, similar things. You didn't learn this in this life. You're going to try. You're going to try it again in the next life. You didn't understand about gluttony. You're going to figure that out. You can't get over fear in this life. You're going to be challenged again with fear in the next life. Things like that. So that's probably what it's one of my favorite films in sure. that sense. And, and it's never... funny as shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I love that movie. But I never really thought of it uh, about reincarnation, right? And and our trials. I just looked at it that way. Yeah, I just looked at it that way. I was like, oh my God. I just came to me one day. I was like, Jesus, this movie is this movie is about reincarnation. This is the soul's journey. Again and again. It just told in a very fun funny way but if you sure. look beyond the jokes it's a pr profound film i mean it's sure. really profound what there's another film i think it's like a dog's purpose right it talks about like animals oh, yeah. that reincarnate right yeah yeah, so, yeah like my purpose, wife yeah. I always you know my wife's like i love that movie and then my my <laughs> wife is a my wife's a like cradle catholic right and so she's like she can get behind the idea that dogs do that but but god forbid us right god forbid right. us so i'm like well what why would it be why would dogs just do that and not us and she's like her head starts to like you know you see smoke coming out of her head like the, the, the gears you, start freezing up 
Well, yeah, because she's holding on to programming that she got when she was a kid. If mm -hmm. she would have been born a Muslim into a Muslim family, she'd be Muslim. If she would have been born in a Jewish family, she would have been Jewish. If you look at things like that, then you're like, well, wait a minute. Then my belief system is just based on programming. It's not something that I came to. It is something that I was programmed with mm -hmm. from birth. Not anything malicious about it. It's just the way it was. I was raised a Catholic. My parents were raised Catholic, so that's why they raised me as a Catholic. Mm -hmm. um, and But I decided to, things didn't make sense for me in that religion, so I started to experiment and go out other ways. But anytime anyone asks me about um, reincarnation, I always go like, oh, they can't, that can't, doesn't make any sense. I go, well, first of all, a couple things. One, um, two billion, two and a half billion people believe in it, so it's pretty arrogant that the major minority is like, you're all wrong. So right. there's that. And oh, by the way, they've been around for four or 5,000 years longer than you. So that's fine. It's okay. So <laughs> ignore that part of it. But just on a logical standpoint, if this is the only experience I have as a soul, because if we all believe there's a soul and we came into this life, so you mean to tell me that the only experience I'm going to have is as a male who lives in America and all the experience as a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. And that's this base case, you know, best case scenario, or your experience is only going to be Trey. Like that's mm -hmm. it as a male. Yeah. How about, you know, how about the people who were born in Ethiopia who are starving? That's it. That's the one shot. You mean sure. it's all luck. It yeah. seems to be jacked up yeah. or that you were born and you lived two or three years and you died of malnutrition. You mean to me that was the experience that that soul get and that's all they get. Mm -hmm. It makes no logical sense where, on a logical standpoint, an evolution of a soul to become essentially, essentially an ascended master afterwards, like a Jesus, like a Buddha, like a Yogananda, these kind of people that eventually go through so many lives and understand the, the, the concept of liberation and understand that this – they come to a, a complete understanding that this is an illusion, that they, they transcend the physical while still being in the physical, and then they go, okay, and now when they – they transition back up. They're like, I don't have to go back down there. I've learned everything I need from this plane. We don't know what's outside after this, the sure. other levels, the other places. But at this place, that makes sense to me. That makes logical sense to me as 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 anything. Much more logic than like you get one shot and that's it. So you mean it's a basically a lottery? Sure. Because you're being born a male, a white male. I'm Latino, by the way. But if you're being born a white male in America. In this time, it's one thing, but being born a black man in South Africa during apartheid is another thing, or a black man in slavery times, or you know, or you know, a, 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 a Mongolian during Genghis time, Gong's time, and, and you know, whatever. It doesn't make any sense. It, it doesn't make any sense that this is the only time we're going to do this. It yeah. just doesn't make logical sense for me, at least. And then when you challenge someone's belief system like that. It is, it, it's not even you're challenging. If you present ideas that challenge them, they become defensive because their entire world is based around these ideas. And if those ideas are not right, then who am I? Mm -hmm. What am I doing? And then it just starts opening up doors that they don't want to go into because they're happy, they're content. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. If that's the choice they want to make and they want to live in that world, Great. Sure. They could live a happy, healthy life. They could be of service to millions of people. They could help. There's no reason why you have to accept these ideas. But if you're truly an open-minded person, I accept, I open up, I'm open to ideas from every walk of life. And I see what rings true to me because I don't have a set belief system that doesn't make sense that, that, that I'm holding on to. There's so core values now that I have like reincarnation. Like it's very difficult for someone to tell me that reincarnation doesn't exist because I know it's my truth. And if they, and if your wife believes that her truth is her truth and that's what she wants to hold on to. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I'm sure it makes interesting dinner table conversations. <laughs> uh, <laughs> hey, listen, you know, it, it, it is what it is, but. Um, well, yeah. When you challenge that belief, you're not just challenging their beliefs. You're challenging their parents' beliefs, oh, their yeah. neighbors' everything. beliefs, their societal beliefs, everything. So like what you're seeing in that, what is triggering that person is like, well, if this isn't true, then everything my parents have told me my entire life. Is 
Oh, it opens up all sorts of cans of worms. It, uh, look, this is the concept. Uh, this is some concept I want the audience to hear. The concept of good and bad is based on where you were born. 100%. And good and bad is, is in many ways an illusion. And I'll explain. And I use this example all the time on my show. If you get into a car accident and you get into a, bump, you know, a fender bender, it's bad day for you, bad day for the person you hit or hit you. It's a horror. It's like, ah, oh, shoot, I got to do insurance now. My car's banged up. It's going to go in there. Got to go into the shop and all this kind of stuff, right? So it's a bad day for you, right? Mm -hmm. You take that car to the mechanic, to the body shop. Great day. Great day for me. I got business. Same incident, two different perspectives. So the thing, so if a tree falls on somebody in the middle of the forest and kills them, the tree is the incident that it killed them could be tragic. But from my point of view, like, oh man, the guy's dead, poor guy. But the wife is sitting there. I'm like, thank God that son of a bitch is dead. He's been beating me for 10 years. Perspective. Do you see what I mean? Sure. So the concept of good and bad is really based on where we come from because things that you and I believe are good and bad in society, in other countries, in the other side of the world, they don't look at it that way. Women's rights, we, yeah, I'm mm -hmm. assuming, please forgive me. I'm assuming we all believe that you know, women have should have rights. Other parts of the world, they don't. Yep. And if they even talk, they're beheaded. So- do you see what I mean? It's all based on where you come from and where you're, how you're brought into this world that your belief system is based on. And when you understand that and you start searching for the truth for yourself, but that takes a brave step and not everybody wants to take that step. And trust me, it wasn't easy for me. And I'm sure it wasn't easy for you either. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not an easy step because once you, the basis of your entire existence or your entire mental structure is challenged, then you got to start questioning everything. And if you got to start questioning everything, then you're like, Oh, I don't, yeah. I don't want to do that. Yeah. I, I'm not, I just much rather, what, what do you mean? The sky's not blue. I don't understand. Yeah. Because <laughs> you where know? do you go for that advice or that information, right? You go you to start friends, searching. you go you to, you go to people that you rely on and trust. And then like you go to them and you start figuring out that, Oh man, they're, they're just telling me what their perception is of the event or what I'm going through. Like they don't truly know because it's not their experience. So, you know, I guess my question to you is like, this is a good uh, segue into like, how do you discern your truth? How do you find the teachers that uh, come on your show that you discern that what they're teaching is big truth? The, I don't always agree with my guests. I'm going to say I agree with most of my guests and I agree with most of what everything that my guests say. Um, but the truth has to be something that rings true to you. And you have to be at a place in your life when you're ready to hear that truth. Like I said, I was given the autobiography of a yogi when I was younger. I couldn't connect with it. I wasn't ready for it. I might have never been ready in this lifetime. It could have been another lifetime where that book shows up again. Mm -hmm. When I was like this time, left time, I, I, you know, I need to, I need to pick this information up. But this, but maybe I wasn't ready for it. But when I was ready for it, it, it arrived. So that old thing is like when the student is ready, the teacher appears. And that teacher could be a podcast episode. It could be a book. It could be a movie. It could be a play. It could be a sign. It could be a TV show. It could be uh, a sign on the road. It, it could be anything. But the truth is something that rings true to you. When I first heard the concept of reincarnation, it made sense to me. Mm -hmm. And I was raised Catholic. It was just right. It just automatically made sense to me because you know what didn't make sense to me? You eat meat on Friday, you go to hell. You also kill somebody, you go to hell. A little bit unproportionate, I think. Sure. You know what I mean? Oh, then they changed it and they're like, now you can eat meat on Fridays. So what happened to all those guys who went to hell? Like, is there, is it retroactive? Do they get a release program? Retroactive. Like, is back it like, what, what, like back pay for pain and suffering of being in hell? Like, what does it work? So you start looking at all these ideas, but there's certain concepts that I don't believe are man-made. Many religions have man-made elements to it. But when you understand truth, like concept of reincarnation, the concept of karma, I just had an expert, hasn't been released yet. I had an expert from India 
all we talked about was karma. He's a karma expert. And there are elements of what he talked about I didn't believe. I didn't, didn't ring true to me. Very small few things. But the main concepts, the main broad strokes of our conversation were profound. You know, even talking about generational karma, which is a new mm -hmm. concept that I didn't really understand mm -hmm. until I started delving into generational karma and things like that. So it, it's 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 a fascinating thing, but it, it has to ring true to you and make sense to you, and not out of fear either. You know, a lot of people will jump on the idea because of fear, mm -hmm. yeah, and hold on to it because of fear. If you're holding on to an idea because of fear. That might not be the idea that you need to hold on to. You might want to search for something that you could hold on to because there's love involved. There's understanding. Well, there's truth, true, true truth involved. You know, when I speak to some of these spiritual leaders, when they talk to me, they're like, they, you, they go, Alex, you seem to be steadfast. I'm like, I know. I, I, I just know for me what makes sense for me. Mm -hmm. I'm not wishy-washy about it. It's, it makes sense to me. You don't believe it? That's fine. And I'm not pushing it on you. That's the other thing. If it's your truth, it's not somebody else's truth, so don't push it on them. Sure. If they come and they ask, you you tell them. Or if they come and watch an episode, they'll watch. Mm -hmm. But I have a lot of people who are hardcore in their religions who come and watch my show because they're curious. Sure. Because there's a point now in in the evolution of humanity that we're all starting to wake, wake up. And that's why we're going through so much shit right now. And so much crap is going on because we're everything's bubbling up. That's been quiet for such a long time. It has to bubble up so it can be healed and get rid of it. And we have to acknowledge that it exists. And that's what's happening right now in, in the world, at least from my point of view. Yeah. Well, I also wonder like if all this stuff isn't just happening for like distractions too, right? Like whatever that, you know, that, um, uh the energy is out there that wants us to see this, the shadow, right? Like the fear, it's also the fear, right? The fear is like trying to create an illusion, but people are seeing through that illusion and being more conscious and, and becoming more aware of like what we truly are. Like even questioning, you know, that, um, you know, I may be a part of source or the universe. Like, what does that mean to me? Well, that means like, if I'm a part of that universe, if I'm a part of the light, then I should be able to do or be whatever it is that I want to be, right? But you can, you can be that. It's just all about your perspective. You have to be like, you know, I might not be able to make things, I might not be able to float in the sky or, or you know, make ash appear from, from out of my hands, but I can come into my daily, daily life with a perspective of like, I'm going to be open-minded about my experiences. I'm going to watch my thoughts more closely. I'm going to be aware that my biases are painting a picture and that I have control over my experience. I don't know that any of that makes sense, but it's like, mm -hmm. um, because we get caught into like, if you're, you know, I know for me, some of the interviews that I've had with some new agers, it's always like, um, you know, you are associated with this higher power or God. And it's like, people automatically think, well, I have these superpowers. I don't know. Maybe we can. I don't know. But it's just like for right now, I think the world needs to take baby steps into this new reality or this new concept of us being connected to something higher. And I think the illusion is starting to show us like with all the disruption and all of the chaos that's going on, like waking us up. It's like a wake up call. Like, you know, how like Zen, Zen monks will like slap their students in the head or say awake. Like, I feel like that's what reality is doing to us right now. It's like, they're mm -hmm. slapping us in the back of the head saying, awake, awake. Like there's more to this reality than what you're seeing. You're there's more to you than what you're seeing. Like going back to Shawshank redemption, like crawling through your own shit, like coming out on the other side and then having that awareness of like, I don't know, that bliss, that blissful state of being like in heaven and, and realizing the path and, and, and honoring where you're at in that path. I think that's the hardest part, especially for myself. It's like honoring the part of the path where I'm at, but if I can't honor this, I'm not going to appreciate where I, where, where I end up. The bottom line is that you don't need a middle man to, to talk to God. Hmm. Uh, you don't need to do any of that. That if you understand that you are God, you are part of source like all of us are, we are all one, we are all connected. If you understand that and start to believe that, 
that's extremely powerful. And all of this fear mongering and, you know, God forbid, watch the daily, you know, the nightly news and things like that. All that starts to wear away. Look, all of those, all of those, those channels are struggling. All mm -hmm. of them. Uh, all the all the news networks, they're all struggling because they're still using the old playbook. They don't understand that, yeah, fear works in the short term. And that's what they did. They, you know, fear, if you're afraid, you're gonna buy more, you're gonna consume more. And that's part of marketing. You know, if you're a marketer, you understand that fear is a motivator. But people are tired of it and they're starting to get tired. And this new generation coming up, they don't, they are not playing that game. You know, you know, you and I are of a bit older. You're younger than I am, but you know, we grew up at a different time than they did, and that they are going right now. And our parents are a whole other conversation. But fear is not going to be working as much in the future. It isn't now. Mm -hmm. It really isn't. People are tired, exhausted of it. The pandemic was just a huge, giant, you know, reboot of everybody. That's why nobody wants to go back to work. Everybody wants to like, no, 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 I want to go. I'm going to do my thing. I'm going to, I'm going to start a podcast, uh, you know, things like that. But if we understand that we are all one and have empathy for each other, that's more powerful and un, un impenetrable mm -hmm. by anybody or anything. If you understand that within yourself, uh, you know, that truth to be true within yourself. It's nothing that can move you. Mm. Nothing. Nothing on this plane, at least. Nothing in this in this reality can. You, you know, when you speak to a yogi, you speak to a monk, they are so steadfast in their understanding of who they are and what the nature of reality is for them. There is no moving them in a very positive way, by the way. You know, they are they're nothing but empathetic and love and want to teach and want to share and want to help others, you know, go in the path that they have to go down. But it's not like a dogmatic thing. It is more of a loving thing. Mm -hmm. wow. And I guess that's from experience of just being able to be exposed to people like that, which most people aren't. And hopefully through the shows that I do and that you do, they start to get more exposed to, to that kind of soul, those kind of people. And that's why I do what I do because you know, before I, I didn't even, I've heard of near death experiences, but I didn't really understand them. I didn't know anything about them until I started doing the show. And then channelers, forget about it. I'm like, that was insane for me. And now they're my favorite guests. I love channelers. And sure. then quantum physicists who talk about spirituality. What? <laughs> <laughs> Neuroscientists, you know, all these kind of people that come on the show. It's, it's pretty remarkable. But the point of the show is to ex to expose people from around the world to these ideas to see if it helps them awake in mm. their own way without not selling anything, not trying you to, to, to join the church of Alex or the church of next level or, or, or the church of Trey. It's like, it's not that it's like, these are ideas from all walks of life, by the way, if you've been listening to my show, it's not just one way, one way, one way, one way. It's not like I have 50 yogis in a row. Um, you know, I have, I have, I'm going to be interviewing a grand, a grand master uh, in Chinese martial arts wow. coming on who like crushes bottles with his chi. And wow. I've seen the video. But how I've do you never find spoken... these people? How do you find, like, how do you, they do find, they, are they, are they reaching they... out to you now? Some reach out to me, but some of them will just come. The, the universe is just sending them to me, for lack of a better word. If I want to get woo-woo, I open up YouTube. They just show up, and there's oh. things that pop up. And and it's kind of like when I read in my comments, like, oh, my God, that your show just popped up in my feed, and it was exactly what I needed to hear today. Thank you. This episode on fear is exactly what I needed to hear today. Um, the universe is working all the time behind the scenes, doing everything that they need to do to get you to where you need to be. And I'm just a facilitator, just like you, mm -hmm. you know, someone will find an episode that you did and move them in a way that you won't even understand around, you know, halfway around the world. Sure. So Alex, man, I could speak to you all day, buddy. <laughs> um, last question. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to steal it from you and I'm paraphrasing and I'm going off the cuff here, uh, using sure. it from one of your episodes. I think it is. You ask your guests, all your guests, like 
what is God? Is that right? Like, what is yeah. God? What's the definition? Of, what is your definition of God? Yeah. What is the definition of God? All there is is the best answer I've heard. All there is, all there ever will be, and pure love. That is mm. God. Um, there is no judgment. There mm. is no judgment. My favorite term is like I heard someone say. I think it's one of my upcoming episodes. I use it in in, in the description. I think. Um, I expected a courtroom, but understand I was in a classroom. Hmm. And that's how you kind of look at this. There is no judgment. No one is judging you for the mistakes you made. God is not a, a old man with a white beard that if you don't do exactly what he says, throws you into an eternal hell. That does not make any sense to me because you have children. I have children. Is there anything that they can do in this lifetime that would that would make you want to throw them into an eternal hell. No, never. So if we can't do it, you think sources, that's their game plan. That's pretty egocentric. I think that you must, you must bow down to me because I am all powerful. It's pretty egocentric, not the loving God that I know and not the loving God that I've read about in so many religious texts around the world and, and people I've spoken to and, yeah, that's a long answer to that short question. I love it, though, I man. I, it. I love it. I love it. I love it. How can people connect with you? How can they find out more? Um, if they want to, if you want to check out the show, it's at nextlevelsoul.com. dot com on YouTube. It's Next Level Soul. Uh, I, I, it's not hard to find me. Uh, those are the two best places to find out this information uh, and the show that we're doing. We now are outputting. There's a new show. There's a new video every week, every day. Excuse me, on uh, on YouTube. We have four new episodes a week. Uh, because I'm insane. Uh, I am going to slow down. Not yet, but I will slow down. <laughs> I just got too many people that want to come on the show and too many things I want to do. I want to get this thing out there. We're closing in on almost 200 episodes wow. in less than a year and a half. That's awesome. So, yeah, but that's where people could find me and, and hopefully they can they can um, find some value in what I do. Sure. Alex, my friend, man, we got to do this again, dude. I really like chatting with you and i like your philosophies and i just feel like you're a good all-around guy so appreciate thank you for you, taking man. the time and i really do i love every second of this i appreciate you and thank you so much for the work you're doing man it's something that you know this is this is work that needs to be done man you are doing god's work in many ways my friend so keep doing keep doing what you're doing i appreciate you man